Hello and welcome to this brief video on communication skills in family medicine using the Calgary Cambridge model. This is from the Department of Family Medicine at RCSI Perdana University of Medicine and Life Sciences. I'm Professor Anthony Cummins. Communication skills are vital in medicine and they are a series of learned skills. Experience itself can be a very poor teacher and communication skills <coughs> can be taught and will lead to an improvement in the quality of communication skills and changes in doctor behavior. There are specific learning methods required to produce such changes. For example, observation. So as a medical student, you may watch the general practitioner or the medical officer in the clinic as you had and consulting with the patient, observe the sorts of questions that are used, what notice is taken of nonverbal behaviour. You may also benefit from detailed and descriptive feedback. Feedback should always be prompt and specific. So for example, when you have presented a case to the GP or medical officer, they should tell you specific aspects which were good and also those that could be improved. So for example, they may comment on aspects of your history taking, saying that your differential diagnosis was not sufficiently wide, or they may comment on your physical examination skills and specifically on, for example, how you examined that patient's abdomen. Feedback, which is general, is too vague. For example, a doctor telling you that that was very good is not helpful. You need to know what specifically was very good. And similarly, if you're told that your assessment was bad or poor, they need to tell you specifically which elements of it needed attention. We cover some of this in our video consultation sessions, which we do in weeks one and week seven. And in these sessions, you will each individually be videoed with a patient during a six minute consultation. And at the conclusion of all of the video consultations, we will then review them along with the patient and we will all make comments about specific aspects of the consultation. It's also very important to practice and rehearse those clinical skills, be they communication skills or physical examination skills. And for this, we have a dedicated session, which is based at the Clinical Skills Unit in PU, where you will be given uh, OSCE-like assessments, looking at physical examination, um, practical procedures and so on. And these are all run exactly like an OSCE. Each station is six minutes, but unlike the OSCEs in their exams, in these, at the conclusion of each individual OSCE station, you'll be given both verbal and written feedback. You will be given the OSCE sheet to keep, and this is for you to practice. So you should buddy up with another student throughout the year and practice, practice, practice. We also have active small groups of one-to-one -one learning where we have role playing and we have introduced this year a new concept of game playing where we use um, a dice and some instruction cards for you to develop a medical story based on the throw of the dice. We also have another game where you wear a, a headband which has a diagnostic label on it that's not visible to you. Uh, you are the doctor and you have two or three other students sitting in front of you who can see the label and you ask them questions to a maximum of 10. Do I have breathlessness or whatever symptom to which they can only answer yes or no. And by the end of the 10th question, we would hope that you will be able to arrive at the diagnosis or at least at a differential diagnosis. It's also a fun way to learn communication skills and the construction of a differential diagnosis. In patient-centered consultation models, there are two frameworks that operate. One is 
the disease framework or the biological model, which is the way that typically doctors approach it. This would be based on things like the history, the history of the presenting complaint, examination findings, investigation, and thereafter the construction of a differential diagnosis. The illness framework, which is the patient's agenda, is entirely different. This would concentrate on the patient's concerns, the patient's ideas about the symptoms and their feelings, and also their expectations of what they hope to get from this consultation. And this gives an understanding of this particular patient's unique experience of this illness. The most successful consultations that are satisfying for both doctor and patient are those where both these frameworks are integrated into a whole. There is a reference here to Cecil um, Hellman's work way back in 1981 published in the British Journal of General Practice which goes through this in more detail and it's worth clicking on this subsequently and reviewing it. You can do this through the PowerPoint but not through the video. This is an overall structure of this particular model, the Calgary Cambridge model, which shows a, a structured uh, outline where the consultation is, in, is initiated and then information is gathered about symptoms and the chronology of events etc. This may then be followed by physical examination if that is deemed appropriate. Then there may be some ex explanation to the patient and some planning and finally there's a closing of the consultation. Throughout all of this structured format this is providing a structure to the consultation and it's also building up the relationship, a relationship of trust with the patient. We'll go into some more detail now of the different elements of this structured format. So for example in the initiation of the session there's a preparation for it, there's an establish, establishing an initial rapport and identifying the reasons for the consultation. And if, for example, you work in a three or four doctor group practice, you may wonder at this initial stage, why has this patient come to see me rather than the other three doctors? And why has this patient come now? And these are questions that you may ask, are you, but certainly you should be contemplating them in your own mind. You then begin the process of gathering information, exploring the patient's problems and discover both the, di the biomedical perspective, the doctor's agenda, and also the patient's perspective. And trying to find background information and putting things in context, you may then proceed to physical examination and further to explanation and planning. So providing accurate information, um, aiding accurate recalls to get the patient to repeat back advice you've given or explanation you've given to ensure that they understand this and that helps in a shared understanding and also in shared decision making. You would then proceed on to closing the session and ending the consultation, but this would be uh, involving also further planning. So for example, if you have decided that the patient's illness is probably self-limiting and doesn't require any active treatment, for example, an upper respiratory viral infection would not require antibiotics, but you may wish to see them again in, let's say, one week to ensure that all has resolved as predicted. And while you're proceeding throughout this consultation, you are using appropriate nonverbal behaviour, observing the patient's nonverbal behaviour, developing a rapport, and you try to involve the patient throughout the process. This is some more detail on gathering information throughout the consultation. And these are the sort of skills for exploring the patient's problems. You need to hear the patient's story, the patient's narrative. And your questions should be a mixture of open and closed questions. And we will go through these, uh, that style of questioning in another few screens. Listen attentively. And try to pick up on cues and nonverbal cues. You may need to clarify if you feel the patient hasn't understood what has been discussed. Time framing is about trying to keep to time and keep the consultation within a reasonable time. 
and again you are looking at two separate frameworks the disease model and the illness model this is the patient's uh, model which is more concerned with his or her concerns expectations the effects on life and also the emotional side of why this patient has consulted you and how they are feeling you obviously need to pick up also relevant background history which would help you to form a differential diagnosis and ultimately f uh, to reach the correct diagnosis so you need all of these elements also like medication history allergy family history etc active listening is about hearing what is said this is what the patients want to communicate. We also hear what is not said verbally. What are they communicating to you through non-verbal uh, demonstrations without realizing it perhaps? You also want to keep your ears open for what is not said at all, which it might be something they may not wish to communicate. So for example, there may be concerns about an emerging depressive illness, concerns about uh, sexually transmitted infection, uh, etc. The next few screens are simply repeating what I've just been saying in the last few screens, but about greeting the patient, obtaining the patient's name. You will be amazed how many times when patients go and see doctors, the doctors neither introduce themselves nor ask the patients their name. Sometimes some doctors don't even look up from the desk while they're writing a prescription to even look at the patient. It's very important that you should introduce yourself and clarify your role. So always say that, hello, good morning, I am Dr. X. Um, thank you for coming to see me. Please have a seat or, or something along those lines. Again, you should identify early on what the problems are and why the patient has come to see you. Why me and why now are really two important questions. You should listen attentively, try not to interrupt. A big complaint against doctors is that they interrupt a patient very early on in the flow of their story and they don't feel able to tell the full story. The average GP interrupts a patient within about 20 seconds of them starting to give their story. You need to check and confirm with the patient what the list of problems are and you sometimes need to do this more than once to check that you're, you are clear about it and also they are clear about any instructions, advice, recommendations you have given. This is the what I referred to earlier about the opening and closed questions. So an open question would be, what can I do for you today? This does not have a specific answer. It's not a yes or no question. It's a question that invites an open chat about what the patient wants. A closed question on the other hand is something like are you allergic to any medications? And the answer to that is either yes or no and if yes you may prompt another question which ones? You should listen attentively throughout the consultation and clarify anything that appears to be vague or needs amplification. Language should be appropriate, it should not be full of jargon or technical information. Most people don't have um, good health literacy. That means that even despite high levels of education, they don't understand medical terminology, medical jargon. So you should try to steer away from that. Watch also for nonverbal behavior, eye contact facial expression. Patients who suffer from depression, for example, and consult their doctor, they often have poor eye contact and they may have a, an expression of sadness on their face. What's their posture, their position and movement? Be alert for vocal cues. If you are writing notes or using a computer to enter the patient's story, do so in a manner that doesn't interfere with the dialogue or rapport. You may prefer to allow yourself a, maybe a few minutes after the consultation to enter the notes on the computer system. At the end, you should summarize to make sure that the patient understands exactly what is happening.
These are skills that you get better and better at with more practice. Here's some references for you. Uh, the first one is a book written in 1998, but it's um, one of the cornerstones of teaching communication skills. There are some website links also here to this one is uh, a reference to the Calgary Cambridge system and it's uh, quite useful and quite clear. The Calgary Cambridge uh, model of consultation has been introduced into many general practitioner training programs throughout the UK and this is a link to one of them here. And then we look at uh, aspects of improved patient GP communication and does it improve clinical outcomes in people with cardiovascular disease for example this was a systematic review of the evidence um, there are some videos here this is an excellent video by Dr Jonathan Silverman one of the co-authors of this textbook on the art of communication in medicine it's quite entertaining and quite informative and this is the reference to Cecil Hellman's paper from 1981 that I mentioned at the start of this video. Thank you.